This is Julia Robinson. In 1948, just after completing her PhD, she made the first of several important conjectures about Hilbert's 10th, one of the great unsolved problems in mathematics. Also in 1948, a Russian baby was born named Yuri Mariasevich. He grew up to become a mathematician too, and was also interested in Hilbert's 10th. In 1970, when he was just 22, he read Julia Robinson's most recent paper, which gave him the final piece he needed to prove the impossibility of H10. Robinson was so excited, she wrote him a letter, and he wrote back, and so began a fruitful collaboration that lasted until Robinson's death. This Russian man and American woman worked together in the 70s and 80s through the height of the Cold War. They had generational, gender, um, language, and political barriers to overcome, not to mention that they had to communicate using uh, overseas mail that took forever because Soviet censors were very interested in letters filled with math. <laughs> They worked in a variety of ways together. They listened to and built on each other's ideas. They argued with each other. They critiqued each other's work. And when they were stuck, they brought in more collaborators. They managed to do all of this fantastic collaboration without a teacher saying, OK, so Hilbert's 10th is going to be a group project. <laughs> <laughs> they worked together because they actually needed to. Mathematicians work in varied and complex ways, and I would like us to teach our students how to collaborate in ways that are this fluid and powerful. I've chosen four types of interactions that are authentic to the discipline, but also have high yields for us from a classroom um, and pedagogical point of view. So I'm going to take them one by one, very, very, very fast, Ignite style. But before I do, I want to give props to working alone. Um, we all need individual think time. We all need to be able to say, I really need some time to work on this problem by myself before I'm ready to talk to anybody else about it. And we need to teach our students to say that. We also need to teach them to say, actually, I've got this one solo. Thanks. Because we only want to work with someone else on a problem if we need more minds on the job. When we feel that need, we seek out what I'm calling a thinking partnership. The invitation to a thinking partnership sounds like, could we work on number four together? Or could I run something by you? The language is raw and unfinished. The work is generative and supportive and unorganized. Students learn how to listen to and nurture each other's ideas as they zigzag through puzzling problems together side by side. But sometimes they get stuck. And now they need an influx of new ideas. So that is when they get up and they go check out what their colleagues are doing, like we're doing here right now. This is cross-pollination, a different type of interaction that fills a different need. The teaching around cross-pollination is really interesting because we get into issues like credit, who owns an idea, how do I get inspired by someone else's idea but then make it my own? What happens if someone takes my idea and changes it? Is it still mine? The third type of interaction also involves treating other people's ideas with respect. And this is a math dispute. Um, so this is when, oh, I just lost where I was in my thing. <laughs> um, math disputes are delightful if we teach students how to have them. What they need to say are things like, I think I hear what you're saying, but I disagree with you because uh, we need to teach them skills like representing their arguments, listening to each other's arguments, changing their minds publicly and with pride. And finally, the last type of interaction is critique, which mathematicians do formally and informally all the time. The language here would be things like, um, can you prove me wrong? I need a skeptical friend to try to make this better. How can I make my rep representation more clear? Through analysis of student work, both group and individual, we can teach students how to give and receive feedback that is specific and kind and helpful and constructive, and then act on it. Those are skills I want in my colleagues. Ultimately, the goal here involves student independence. We um, generous and effective colleagues know how to identify what they need and get that from their colleagues, and also to hear what our peers need and give that. That's why we need to teach students how to ask for, how to signal what type of interaction they want. Now, this type of teaching is not fluff, and it's not an indulgence. 
It is part of our job to socialize students into the collaborative culture of mathematics and to equip them to be good colleagues, whatever their ultimate profession. So I hope you'll be my colleague. Um, if you want more detail about how to do all this, keep an eye out for my book. But in the meantime, think things through with me, swap ideas with me, give me criticism, argue with me, because that's the kind of collegiality I am interested in. Thanks. Thank you.